Folks, it is Tuesday, March 9th. I'm Guy Adami, joined as always by my dear friend Dan Nathan for this week's macro setup. This week brought to you by Nadex, the leading U.S. exchange for binary options, knockouts, and call spreads. See, I didn't do it to you that time. Dan, how are you today? Uh, doing okay, Guy. I get my face ripped off a little bit. I thought I had that turn in the S&P 500 yesterday. We were seeing some pretty interesting underperformance from mega cap tech over the last few weeks. I thought the S&P 500 was slowly going to roll, but wow, bam, you know, we see this huge rip today. I can't really figure out what the heck is going on. Can you make any light of this thing? No. Hey, listen, me as well. The, the NASDAQ basically went down 1,000 points, so a little more than that in a straight mm -hmm. line. Uh, and I thought it would continuation. I, I, I'll tell you what I think is going on, and, and you see if I'm wrong. A lot of people will say the sell-off happened too fast, and the fact that yields have now seemingly slowed down their move yeah. to the upside and it backed up a bit, I think that has people saying, all right, maybe David Tepper's comments yesterday that he didn't see yields going much higher, and he thought this was an environment that you could still own stocks. I mean, maybe that's making its way into some of the buying patterns we're seeing. In addition, you know, the stimulus package, which we're going to talk about, the fact that the vaccines have rolled out in a very meaningful way, and I think a lot faster than most people thought. I think that's all adding to it as well. In my opinion, Dan, and we're obviously going to talk more about this, I think this move a little bit lower in yields is just temporary. I think yeah. we're headed significantly higher than the highs we made uh, last week, I think 1.62 or so percent. And I think the market's going to take its cues from that. But in terms of today and today's price action, it's got me as well, Dan. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. So let's talk with with like the headline right now. The headline is that the House passes this $1.9 trillion bill. This was after the, the Democrats. They passed it without a single Republican. Um, I think some, uh, obviously there's a lot of politics going on there. I think we could all agree that the scope of it, you know, $1.9 trillion, this is coming a few months after they did that nearly $1 trillion package, yeah. which came, you know, six months or seven months after like the nearly $2 trillion package before that, I guess the thought is is that that maybe it's just too much right to too many uh people and that we really run the risk of just kind of uh you know inflating a risk asset bubble by putting so much liquidity into the economy i think the democrats feel like listen we can't afford to screw this up especially when we see light at the end of the tunnel as it relates to like you said the vaccine rollout is going well you know the biden administration is yep. going to have 100 million shots in arms in the first 100 uh, 100 days of the administration and i think you're just starting to see the the prospect of the economy opening up in a meaningfully way for the first time in a while guy doesn't it kind of feel being here in the new york metropolitan area doesn't it kind of feel like we're really getting close you know especially the weather today's the first really nice day in new york it was 30 degrees yesterday it's like 60 some degrees today and it feels like we're ready for a bit of a reawakening no question about it. And people getting all, I understand, I and mean, people want out. It is, it feels like spring. I think it's going to be 65 degrees on Thursday. And I think that adds to um, some of that pent up demand that people feel. And they want to get out there, they want to do things, they want to spend money. You know, you said the Democrats don't want to mess this up. I'm sure nobody wants to mess it up. But in many, you know, history is littered with disastrous outcomes born of really well intentioned human beings. And I think we're on the midst of that now. After this deal is passed, it's 1.9 trillion. We'll round it to two. You're talking about U.S. debt now that is the wrong side of 30 trillion dollars, and that sits on top of a GDP number that's probably around 21 trillion. I'll give you 22 if you want, but you can do that math. You know, we're approaching 150 percent debt to GDP. I, you know, listen, I thought 90 percent was unsustainable, and here we are at almost 150 percent. The market doesn't seem to care, but the moving rates are signifying exactly that, that the market does care. The fact that we've stalled here, you know, maybe it's a couple of days, maybe we do move back to that 1.25, 1.3% that you've talked about, but I'm hard pressed to believe it. I still think rates go higher. And listen, it's a great thing that the economy is opening up and people are excited. I think it could be a devastating thing for the market. And oh, by the way, you saw glimpses of it over the last week and a half, two weeks in that almost 11% move in a straight line in the NASDAQ from peak, from basically an all-time high to levels that we saw yesterday. Yeah, but let me push back a little bit. Okay, push when we back. Talk, well, when we push talk back. about the speed of the market sell-off, you're right, it really did happen in the NASDAQ. Even yesterday or, or Friday at the lows, the S&P, I think, was down 3.5% from its all-time highs just a, a couple of weeks earlier 
Um, you know, so we really saw some air come out of the NASDAQ, which really speaks to the outperformance of the index and some of its big leaders over the last, um, at least the last year or so. Let's talk about the economy. Let's talk about, um, you know, one of the things that I think that is really getting people geeked up today. Um, here's a tweet from David Wessel. Um, you know, he's saying the Biden, Biden stimulus will add 1%, one, one percentage point to global economic growth in 2021. The OEC chief economist says OECD sees 5.6% global growth in 2021, now 1.4% higher than uh, on November Forecast for U.S. GDP 6.5% in 2021 versus 3.2% in November. What's really interesting about this is that, you know, this will be the first time in like 20 years or something like that, or maybe a little less, that the U.S. GDP will be greater than that of China. Now, I think there's something weird going on there. If you think about China had the effects of the pandemic worse than they did with us. They're an authoritarian state. They lock down in a different manner. They have different controls over their industries and that sort of thing. There's a lot of state-owned industries. <laughs> that... The point here is that the U.S. is going to lead the way, and let's use that as a thread as we work through some of these charts. You know, I yeah. just, I'm going to go Look, to the, the U.S. is going to lead the way. I, I'm not denying yeah. that at all. I mean, I think that's great. But, you know, my point has been and my point will continue to be that what's great for the economy might not be so great for the stock market. Right now, um, it's telling a different story. And I think you pull up a great chart, this year-to-date SPX chart is a wonderful chart. As Carter Worth says, Dan, and you're going to yeah. say it for me right now. To the penny in terms yeah. of that trend line. And you got it. To the penny. And we'll see what happens. You know, but when you talk about the divergence that we've seen over the last you know, week or so between the S&P and the NASDAQ, I, I, I'm no great historian, but I you can't remember the last time we've seen such a wide swath or wide gap between what the NASDAQ did and what the S&P or the Dow did on, on any given day. It's really interesting. I think it's a really scary sign. A lot of people say it's not a big deal. It's just a sign that we're transitioning from, obviously, these high growth names to value. I don't know. It scares me. But you know what? I wake up scared in the morning. So I guess maybe I'm not the right person to ask, Dan. Listen, I don't see any reason to not be optimistic about risk assets for the reason that rates are still relatively low. Even if the Fed were to take a more hawkish stance because economic data is better than expected and the reopening is going better than expected, um, you know, we might have some near-term palpitations, but I don't think that kills this, this leg of the bull market. And I think there's plenty of reasons to be optimistic about, you know, on the back half of this year. But to your point, near term, there's some risk. That year-to-date chart in the SPX, you see the channel. It's breaking out above it. Will it try to squeeze back to 39.50, which was the um, all-time high from mid-last month? Maybe. Okay, maybe they do that. Okay, but let's look at this two-year chart, I think, is really interesting of the SPX. Mm -hmm. Because if you draw that trend line from March 2019, you attach it to the highs in February 2020, 20, you attach it to that recent high just in February, you see some pretty interesting technical resistance. That's a simple line there, people. Okay, so let me draw a line um, from the March 2020 lows, and I connect that to the September 2020 lows. And then I connect it to just, you know, we, we just put it together there. We broke that trend line. It's holding above that. It might squeeze to 39.50 or maybe even 4,000. But look at that range to the downside. Look at that rising 200-day moving average that'll be about 3500 pretty soon to me that looks like the level in which we could have a pullback so if you pull back from 4000 guy let's say we get to 3950 or something like that and you got back towards that 200 day moving average of 3500 even you can do that math uh, thank you dan i appreciate that you make fun of me at my age but i actually can it's do not that about math. your age it's about and if you think about, about it on up here brother no it's fair it, it is fair and listen if you think about what we just saw over this week Yesterday, yeah. yesterday being Monday, Apple traded down to 116 or so. I only yeah. mention that because the 200-day moving app average in Apple is 113.80. So Apple yeah. effectively tested its 200-day moving average. And, I, you know, that seems to be the bellwether for everything. I think it stands to reason that at some point we're going to see the S&P do similar. History suggests that we do see a retrace over a period of time. And the fact that we've stayed above it at this pace for so long indicates to me you're going to have a pretty significant move to the downside. Personally, I think it's going to coincide with rates continuing higher, but we'll see what happens. Those lines you drew, though, those are the trend lines, Dan. That steep uptrend line for March has been broken. You have that basically um, not as steep of a, of a trend line to the, to, you know, that connects the tops. A little bit of a pennant formation forming. If you're asking me, I think the pennant breaks down. 
Okay, I am asking you. Okay, I mean, the you know, people you, I can watching, see, I can see. The people no, I can are hear watching the macros. disdain in your, I can hear it in your voice. I can hear it. Not, not at all. Listen, I feel like what's going on in the SPX, in the S&P 500 in particular, is you did see some of those large tech names sell off, but you saw a massive rotation into energy, into financials, into industrials. And that's kind of kept that thing at bay. And that's why it's outperformed the NDX. But at some point, you're, to, I, I guess, and we'll talk about the yields in a little bit. But if you were to see a rise to that 2% level that you're focused on, then they all might go down together. The last time we had yep. that instance in 2018, in November and December, we saw the S&P 500 trade down 20%, 19.99, as you're going to tell me, um, when, when the year old on the 10 year got above 3% and the Fed was tightening and they had to do an about face. So let's look at the NASDAQ though. Now that's hold on NDX. one sec. Now, now I want you to look at this chart, Dan. This is a great chart. The trend line you drew here is effectively yeah. the same trend line you drew in the S&P but, 500 and the SPX, say, but. right? But yeah. you also had, listen, briefly traded above it, then it gave up to the ghost. I think what you just drew here, what we're seeing here, you're sort of, it's the precursor of what we're going to see in the S&P 500. Now, we didn't get down to the 200-day moving average. I understand that. But you saw an extraordinarily precipitous drop, you know, a day or two after breaking that uptrend line. And I think that's what the S&P 500 yeah. is setting up for. You drew the lines. The lines are there. I do think at some point the 200-day comes into, comes into play. But the, now the question is, do we go and do a retest of that uptrend line first? That's the question I pose to you. So you learned, you took a charting class back in like the 20s. The, the, that would be the 1920s yeah. when they were doing them by hand back that's, then. That's, so that's what did funny. they used to tell you back then? They used to say past support becomes future resistance. So that's that right. line you know, was was pretty meaningful technical support. I mean, listen, it tested it just a few times, that sort of thing. Um, but the fact that it broke it, to your point, I think is impactful. So maybe you see a retest of that. Let's see if it can get above it. But this is the NASDAQ 100, the NDX. And when you look at this thing today, up more than 4%, I mean, the seventh largest holding or the sixth or seventh, which is Tesla, um, is up 20% today. That's I mean, insane. 20%. This is a $600 billion market cap company. Um, so, you know, what does that say to you guys to see that sort of volatility? This, I mean, listen, even that, let's just say in the S&P 500, because it's in the S&P 500, um, what does it say to you to see a company or a stock of that size moving like that in one day? It's just well, crazy I, to me. Yeah, I can hear the OK boomers right now typing on Twitter say, because I'm about yeah. to say it. It's, what it says to me is the market structure, at least in the short term, is broken because stocks, should, <clears throat> you know, stocks shouldn't move like that, period. A stock of that size certainly shouldn't move 20. It makes no sense whatsoever. There's nothing you can tell me. The, the, the Tesla story has not changed 38% to the downside over two weeks, and then it's 20% move in one day. I mean, it's just that simple. I mean, you can say what you want about rates, but stocks shouldn't move that way. So if you don't think, you know, if you say to yourself, well, it's a single stock, it can't happen in a broader market, I say horse hockey. And if you can tell me who said horse hockey in a, in a in a uh, series, I will give you five dollars, Dan. Uh, I think it was from um, a Christmas story or Carol. Yeah, that's, that, that's false. That would, would be Colonel Sherman Potter uh, of Mass fame. Oh would yeah, say yeah, horse hockey. Okay. Anyway, okay. So horse right. hockey to you. Potter. Um, all right, let's go to the VIX here. Um, you know, you've had um, a very nice call. I think that oftentimes when you see this thing at 30 and occasionally in the mid to high 30s you um get to the other side of it but oftentimes when you see it kind of pressing down towards that 20 level you see that line on the chart there that's where it kind of broke out above um last february when the market topped and went down precipitously it really hasn't been able i think there was maybe one close below 20 um in the last year is that right 19 and a half percent a couple yeah. fridays ago if you recall yeah. yes dan yeah. i think it was actually before a long weekend if i'm not mistaken but you know that's just me sort of hearkening back but please continue yeah well i'm just saying so what you're taking the vix here at 23 you see risk down to 20 or so is that what you would tell me well and you said oftentimes it happens you said that a couple times so of course immediately i think of so oftentimes it happens that we live our lives in chains and we never even know we have the key obviously a great lyric from an eagle song but the key to the vix here is understanding when we get down to this 21 and a half level as i've said countless times over the last four or five months on the macro setup 
that's your opportunity to either get long volatility or to take profits in underlying equities because within a couple of days, it's proven to be a short-term top in some of these markets. And I think you're yeah. seeing that again. The VIX at 21 and a half in this environment is unsustainable. And you've seen these relief rallies in the VIX now at least four or five different times. Now, I will say um, for the bulls out there, the good news is each time we've rallied, um, the magnitude has been less and less. First time was up to 40. Next time up, maybe 38, 35. This time, I think up to 32. But 21 and a half on the downside has been your line in the sand. And I think that's what's going to happen here again. So why do I look at the VIX? Because I do believe it's a pretty, pretty decent short-term indicator of potential market tops, especially when we pin that 21 and a half level, Dan. Yeah, I think it's worth noting, go back to 2019 in this two-year chart, and you see a series of lower highs, and you do see it where it ground down to like 11, 12. Mm -hmm. That was the 21 that you're speaking of if you just want to look at it that way. So, you know, be careful pressing your longs when you see the VIX pressing that long-term support. Because, yeah, if I were to look at this and I didn't know it was like the VIX, I'd say, yeah, it's making a series of lower highs here. It's got great support in that 20 area. So you just buy it down there. There may come a time where that's kind of the exact wrong place um, to do it. Um, we were just talking rates, Guy. Let, sure we were. Let's look at the the, the the 10 year US Treasury yield because as you've been very spot on on the macro setup and on the CNBC fast money, um, you know, you called the bottom. I remember last summer when uh, the 10 year US Treasury yield got to about 50 bips. Um, it had a pretty, I don't know if you call it steady. When you look at this five year chart, it looks kind of parabolic, but it's off such a low base. It's literally off nearly zero, right? And yeah. so. When I look at this five-year chart, I look at that 2016 low that was definitely down near, what, 1.4% or something like that. 2019 was a little higher, near 1.5%. So we've gotten through that. We paused a little bit, but it's really interesting. Why do we use so many charts? And I know that this is in the podcast store, so do not be afraid to listen to the macro setup in the audio version of the podcast store, because we're just going to speak to this stuff. But look at that red line that I drew at 2% man going back five years that was sure. the high in mid 16 it was the breakout level in late 16 after the election it was the low in 17 um and then it was a breakdown level again in 19 it couldn't get through in late 19 and then you just saw two percent basically down to 50 bips or so so are you think we're in kind of no man's land i i i feel that you really want to say with certainty that we're going to see 2% in the U.S. 10-year at some point in the not-so-distant future. Is that correct? Well, the only, the only thing I'm certain about is my jump shot from 18 feet and in number one, Dan Nathan, just in case anybody was wondering if they want to lace them up at some point. What I will yeah, mention, yeah. though, and you said it earlier in this, that you know past support becomes resistance. And as you yeah. look at this chart, if you're watching the video, that one5 1.55%, was support in 2016, again in the middle of 2019. And now on the upside, it's going to prove to be a bit of resistance as we go up. And that's exactly what's happening. It's not surprising, I don't think, that we're stalling here. And I'm not playing Monday morning quarterback because we have talked about this. I do think we consolidate here. I don't think it's going to take as long as a lot of people think. I know the comments out of David Tepper on Monday, giving people a lot of reasons to get bullish bonds again and yeah. subsequently get bullish the market. I'm not suggesting he's wrong. I just don't think, uh, I just don't agree with him in this case. I question. do think we're going to ratchet up to 2%. Go ahead, question. I will take a question. All right, so I get this from CNBC viewers all the time and people on Twitter are just, why, the people say, why are you guys always quoting what these billionaire investors have mm -hmm. to say? They're kind of unicorns. They're kind of maybe like, you know, you were just talking about the certainty of your 18 foot jump shot, which is kind of laughable. I think I had <laughs> mute on so you guys couldn't hear me laugh at that. Um, but, uh, you know, and, and I get that question all the time. I get that question actually some, from sophisticated investors too, right? right? And so I guess the thing that I think about Tepper, and I met him a bunch really through CNBC stuff, he is like the most plain spoken genius yeah. investor I think 
or me. And I mean that in, in such a, like a complimentary way. I'm not trying to fall all over him. I, I don't know if he's a listener of the macro setup, but my point is, is like, he speaks the way that someone who's really good at what he does and very confident in it and has a great pedigree should speak to people who are trying to learn from him, that sort of thing. So he doesn't speak frequently. And when he does, he's not afraid to kind of make some, um, you know, pronounce sort of um, precast, uh, what, what would you call it? Uh, procrastination procrastination no not procrastination uh, prognostication i'm sorry prognostication. i don't know why i don't know why i, don't I said think, pro, cause, cause i, I don't think brendan will be able i don't think brendan will be able to cut that he's too busy no you uh, shouldn't no you, know, you should allow because i'm sure people will at me about that so why do i quote people like david yes yeah. that's yeah uh, because when yeah. people so when I was interviewing in college in the, as you mentioned, in the 80s, 1880s, uh, E.F. Hutton was one of the firms I wanted to work for. And the old saying was, when E.F. Hutton talks, people listen. And it's the same yeah. way today. There's certain people, when they say things, you have to listen because not only do they know what they're talking about, but the market listens and the market takes its cues off of that. So I pretty much knew when Tepper made those comments yesterday the market was probably going to find support on the downside in terms of the Dow and the, and, and the NASDAQ. And within 24 hours, it did. And that's not me. I'm not, I'm not saying that's any great shakes on my end. It's just what's happened over the last few years. What's really interesting about Tepper is he does make it really interesting, really simple for people to understand. And I yeah. think a lot of times I'm guilty of this. I try to make it more difficult than it has to be. You know, I'm looking three, four levels away, trying to figure out what's going to happen. And he's basically playing the game that's right in front of him, and it's worked for him really well. I think he would admit that, you know, this thing's going to end really badly, but he also was the first person to say that there's no indications that that's on the horizon. I would disagree with that, though. Uh, you know, it's so funny. I mean, maybe it's just like, how is it going to end badly at this point? When you think about it, in the last year, we had the worst – health crisis the world's seen in 100 mm -hmm. years. We had the deepest and sharpest recession we've seen in such a short period of time since like the Great Depression. Um, you know, we literally had a six week bear market. <laughs> like guy, you know, like no, here's the I, thing, I, you know. You're duty like, me, I can like, hear how you. Does it, how, I know, but how does it end badly? Like, like, let me tell you something, you know, I came into the business in 1997 and I lived through the Asian and the Russian and the long-term capital. And then we just saw, you know, like the, the dot com just bubble, just inflate. And it kept on going and going and going. And then finally it burst. And when it burst, it got worse like every quarter. You know what I mean? And then it got worse every year. 2000 was horrible. Then 2001 was really horrible. There was Enron blew up and there was obviously 9-11, right? And there was all these dislocations in the global economy. And then 2002, the market still went lower and made new lows. And it was a protracted bear market and it felt horrible, okay? Mm -hmm. And then obviously the financial crisis, not too different in a lot of ways. And we are still reeling from so some of the changes that we've seen in the market are are still just it's just kind of like the afterflow from the financial crisis but now it seems almost impossible that there would be a protracted um, bear market in risk assets which is exactly probably why it's going to happen and you know i don't want to get all existential on your little rene descartes or john Do paul it. sartre but what i will say is um and you <laughs> folks should google this name if you don't know it michael burry b-u-r-y um He's been, he yeah. really doesn't speak all that much, um, but recently he's been out there and he's making comparisons to what he's seeing now here in the United States to sort of that, um, you know, World War I-ish Weimar Republic when things look so great in Germany and how quickly things turned. And listen, I'm not suggesting we're going to start burning U.S. dollars in our furnaces for heat, um, but, you know, we're going down a very slippery slope in terms of what the Fed policies are, in terms of the debt we've accumulated and what's going to happen to the U.S. dollar, which, by the way, we're going to talk about in a second. So, you know, that whole notion yeah. of how can it possibly happen? Well, the warning signs are clearly there. Right now, the market's not heating any of them. Okay, Doomer. All right, here, just real quick, uh, yeah. here's the TLT. This is, this is the, this is the, this is the, the five, this is a five-year chart of the 20-year U.S. Treasury ETF. This trades 
inverse to yields, right, guys? So just tell me for those people who think that, okay, maybe Tepper's right, maybe the yields have done going up, and maybe that means that U.S. Treasuries are going about to go up. What does this five-year chart say to you, this 130 to 140 range? Do you think it looks like good support? And I guess the point is with it, you know, or I guess it's, you know, 139.40 right now. I mean, you don't really want to own it breaking that kind of support zone, right? Because this no. is a broken chart. And I, and, I, and and listen, real quickly, we draw lines on a lot of charts because support um, or, or I guess trends are probably one of the most important sort of patterns that you'll see in a chart, right? And when it breaks, you know, those, those trends, usually you see uh, an overflow. What does this chart mean to you? And then let's go to the Dixie, the U.S. dollar index. Yeah, well, quickly, I mean, you see, I mean, you can, if you're looking at this, if you're watching the video, you can actually eyeball that uptrend line from 2018 that we actually broke yeah. uh, sometime last year. And you've seen rates go since August. As this has gone lower, rates have gone higher. 10 yields have gone from 53 basis points to 1.6%. And that's what this is speaking to inverse. Now, we also talked about rates on the upside hitting resistance the same way this is moving yeah. lower is hitting support. It's the same chart, only backwards. What do I think is going to happen? Well, the same way I do think 10-year yields are headed to 2%, I would that would suggest we probably test that early 2018 low of probably 115 or so in the TLT. So if you're playing at home, Right now, an instrument's at about 140. Oh. I think it has room down to 115. And oh, by the way, I think you're going to be surprised by how quickly we get there. That will coincide, by the way, with 10-year yields being right around that 2% level, which, again, by the way, is a huge level of resistance and a huge long-term chart in yields, as Dan has spoken about many, many times on the macro setup. Yeah, so let me ask you this, though, Guy. So the Fed... This one I've gotten what, wrong, because now you're going to the dollar. No, 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 no. What, what is the Fed... What, what benefit did they have at this point, like you've said, you know, they've kept jawboning that they're going to keep rates, you know, really low for a long time. They're going to let inflation run hot. So inflation is starting to pick up, at least signs of it. We've seen um, the 10-year move. Obviously, they control the short end here. So if, if they're looking at the same charts that we are, Right. And they see the 10 year going to 2% and they've pinned Fed funds that basically zero. What does it matter what they have to say about, you know, um, Fed policy if no one really believes them? You know, you know what I'm saying? I no, guess that's the point fair. is. No. Yeah. Well, I mean, but the, what the question is, what is their policy response going to be if inflation, instead of being their desired whatever, two and a half percent, which is horse hockey yeah. twice in one show? is closer to five, five and a half percent. What's their policy response going to be? And they have to do something. They'll continue to say it's transitory and they're willing to let things run hot. But, you know, at the end of the Planet of the Apes, great movie. Do you remember that with Charlton Heston? I don't know if you recall that movie. And Dr. Zayas, they were on the beach. And, and they, asked, yeah. they asked Dr. Zayas, what was Charlton Heston going to find when he, I guess he got on his horse with, uh, with uh, get her name, Bright Eyes, I think what he called her. Anyway. He yeah. said he, he's, he's going to find his destiny. And I think that's what we're looking at here. We're going to find our destiny in terms of how badly central banks have mucked this up. So inflation gets out of control and their policy response is muted or, or, or uh, ineffective, ineffective. That's when this whole thing comes home to roost, when they have to start jacking up rates to catch up and to temper down this inflation that they so want. Be careful what you wish for there, Dan, Nathan. Anyway, back to you. Okay. All right, so here's the year-to-date, uh, the one-year chart of the Dixie. If you look at this thing, you draw that trend line from the March 2020 highs. You attach it to that early November high, which was basically a 94. It's kind of held that downtrend. It just tested it just a couple weeks ago, and now it's above that breakdown level from November. You know, it's trying to put a little bottom in here. I, obviously, you know, that failure above 92 in the Dixie um, could be a thing. Let's go to the five-year chart because maybe now I want to say one helpful. thing real quick. You know, you all along yeah. have been saying you didn't want to remember that game show. I think there's, a, I think they just reinvented it called Press Your Luck. No whammies, no whammies, and it's exactly mm -hmm. that. You know, you spin the wheel and you, you're trying to basically tempt fate by not getting a whammy. Well, I was tempting fate for weeks, saying that I thought the dollar would continue lower. You were the voice of reason, saying too many people on that side of the boat this thing is probably going to spike and you've been spot on. So I want to just give you the proper kudos because wow. it's That's deserved. Fine. 
Oh, well, I think the do- the dollar is interesting. I don't have any like specific expertise in trading currencies. Um, you know, I think they're very interesting inputs to a lot of things that I do trade and do look at very closely. And, um, you know, so the, the dollar is definitely one of those. And I like to trade the UUP that is the ETF that tracks the U.S. dollar index um, every so often. And you know what? I was riding your coattails. I think it was early in the fall. I put on a bearish position in the UUP, but I kind of let held on to it for a little too long. And then we had this bounce. Let's look at this five-year chart. I think this is really interesting. Look at how steep that decline was, obviously, yeah. from the November, or excuse me, from the um, last year's highs here. And that shows that kind of break of that downtrend that it's been. Listen, you know, guy, if it holds 90, even if it like pulls back and holds 90 and holds that downtrend and then holds that support area going back to 2018, that's what you'd say it's kind of trying to make a bottom. And I think it's important to look at when it was kind of bottoming in early 2018, banging around between 88 and 90 um, for a few months there. When it ripped, when it broke out meaningfully above 90, I mean, it went up in a straight line and then you saw a real, you know, nice uptrend over the next year and a half or so. Yeah, it's interesting. I, and this, I mean, it's, it's pretty self, you know, this move has caught me by surprise. Yeah. I never thought we'd get to the levels we're seeing now. I thought we'd continue to do this grind lower, despite the fact that yields were going higher. But here we are, and you have to reevaluate. So if you're asking yeah. me now, I, I don't think anything has fundamentally changed. This $1.9 trillion on top of everything else, as I mentioned, pushes that debt number to $30 trillion. And that, by definition, is going to be bearish for the dollar. But maybe too many people got caught with the same trade, and it's coming home to roost now, manifesting itself in this what is a pretty significant short-covering rally in the U.S. dollar. Yeah, all right. Let's hit a couple of other things. I don't know how we can do the macro setup and not talk Bitcoin. It's really amazing that you know Bitcoin used to be something that macro people – it was a holy war, right? You know, some kind of believe in it and some don't. Um, and then now, you know, it feels perfectly natural to add Bitcoin to a macro conversation, doesn't it? And, and I mean that very seriously, you know. Um, I think that for a lot of people who rail against central banks who don't know anything about crypto, they find themselves making arguments for crypto, you know. Um, you know, looking at this chart right here, I think it's really interesting because since that breakout that we saw in late December above 20,000, in which if you go back and look at a five-year chart, 20,000 was the high um, in that late 2017 frenzy. Um, that was a meaningful technical breakout. It went from 20,000 literally straight to 40,000 in a less than a month or so, which is kind of crazy. So you just draw a couple lines there from that mid-December low, you attach it to the January low, you get yourself right, right above 40,000, mm-hmm. right? And you take the high from early January, you know, it's about 42,000. That's the support level. We almost tested it there um, a few weeks ago. It looks like it's pressing higher towards that um, that prior high, which is I think about 58,000 or so. Mm-hmm. Um, any any I know you're not like a, you know, a heavy coiner here, but what does Bitcoin mean to you in the broader like macro scheme of things? Well, you have to speak it in terms of macro because more and more companies are adopting it and putting it, you know, is basically in lieu of the dollar on their balance sheets. They're putting Bitcoin. I mean, micro strategies as of this taping right now, I think they have, I'm looking at my numbers, 91,064 Bitcoin on their balance sheet, an average price of $24,119. And it's not just them. We talk about it all the time. It's a, a host of companies now that have put them on their balance sheet for a number of different reasons. Now, it goes back to our prior conversation, Dan. To me, it's all about the weaker dollar and what that means and, the, and people's lack of belief in the dollar. So almost by definition, in my opinion, if you're bullish Bitcoin, you have to almost be bearish the U.S. dollar because I think the two – go hand in hand. And I think that's the way you have to look at this. So if you're going to see this move continue higher in Bitcoin, I think it's just a matter of time before the dollar continue its move lower. That's just my opinion. Yeah. And and I don't know how you talk about Bitcoin and you don't talk about gold. So let's just look at the GL. That's the ETF that tracks it because, you know, you would have thought that Bitcoin and gold are fairly highly correlated. They have not been, you know, like that's, that's the weird thing, right? For a few years ago, you know, people were referring to Bitcoin when it had like a, 
hundred billion dollar market cap that it was going to be digital gold. Well, it's turning into that. You know, the market cap got to about a trillion. I think there's about 12 trillion in gold. Let's look at this GLD though. And you see from when rates bottomed in August, that's when gold topped out and you see a fairly well-defined downtrend that's been in yeah. place. You see the breakdown saw um, about a month ago, if you're just looking at the GLD from about 170 and it got as low um, I think is like one, I don't know, a little lower than like 159 or something like that. It's interesting. It stopped to the penny at that June low. If you look at that, so in a, in a pretty fierce rally today, I don't know why the hell it's rallying today with an NASDAQ seems odd to me, but I guess how I would say is maybe you see a move or push back to 170, but man, that 170 looks like no, massive, it's resistance. massive resistance to your point. I think that's what you trade against. Um, people have been, people that have been talking down gold have been right to do so. You know, again, if you had told me in August that, you know, what's going to happen with rates, you know, rates would triple by March of the following year where we are now. What's where's gold going to be? Well, I would have said rates are tripling because inflation's out of control. And then I would have connected those dots and said that means gold has to be significantly higher than the levels we saw at that prior all time high in August. And obviously that's 100 percent wrong. But as you pointed out, we did stop at the June low gives you again something to trade against. And even if you're bearish, I think you can look for a move back to that 170 level that you outlined, which is going to be, to your earlier comment, huge resistance on the upside. Yes, sir. All right, last chart here. Then we got to get the heck out of here. Sure, Let's we do. Crude oil. This is one, you know, we started this conversation talking about a global reflation trade. We know that energy was very hard hit during the pandemic. Global trade ground to a halt, right? When you think of a lot of the uses for crude um they were down pretty dramatically right now it seems to be a bit of a supply demand sort of thing demands picking up and and there was that supply or surprise announcement about supply constraints or at least um output here look at that chart from early october excuse me from early november you see a very well defined um uptrend from what, what about 34 or so um, all the way up to um, recently that high was what, 67, 68, just the other yeah. day, just yesterday. Um, and what if does that chart me, say to you? Yeah, give, I, mean, give me, I want your fundamental take on gold. You used to trade gold back in the, in the 80s and 90s, right? Crude oil. Or, or, or crude oil, sorry, sorry, sorry. No, sorry. I think, yeah, listen, crude. the fundamentals have been in place for quite some time, and we've talked about it. If you watch Fast Money or listen to the macro setup, we've said it a number of times that the way to play this is in some of these levered energy names. And that's been exactly right. Here's my concern now. Everybody seems yeah. consensus now in crude seems to be it's going higher the same way consensus four or five months ago and the dollar was it's going lower. That concerns yeah. me. You've had two, you know, you've, it's the crescendo has taken place. Obviously, the situation in Texas, I think, was one little tailwind for crude oil. And then the last one, uh, that situation in Saudi Arabia, when you had that explosion, I think that was the final one. I actually think we're going to do a back and fill to that trend line. And it might come in the form of some OPEC announcement or OPEC plus that nobody's expecting. But the uptrend is still in place. I do think we're going to test it, though, to the horizontal line that you drew and that uptrend line that you drew, Dan. Okay. All right. So to wrap this up, we had a lot to talk about today. A um, lot of volatility in the equity markets. We've seen you know, interest um, on both ways this week, uh, like really crazy interest um, in some of these high valuation tech in some SPACs, um, you know, Bitcoin is that kind of held in there, you know, the dollar seems like it wants to kind of, um, you know, put a bottom in crude oil is holding that uptrend for now, but it seems to be a little exuberant in the near term. Um, you know, the NASDAQ underperformance worth keeping an eye on versus the XPX. I think you and I are in the same camp. At some point, the S&P 500 is going to test that 200-day moving average. It just depends where and when, because it might be a bit higher than where it is right now at 3550. It would have been fun if we went to camp together, but unfortunately, uh, in my youth, I didn't have the, the funds necessary to go to a fancy camp like you did, Dan. But anyway, you know I what? digress. I, you know what, camp? I, I went to a YMCA camp, Camp Shinjakuk. It was the the capital cities, why I'm saying not far from where you grew up in Croton on the Hudson. It was sure. up there near Albany, you know, um, let me so say, you know, I, it's just, I mean, upstate New York is everybody, everybody that lives south of 14th street thinks everything north of Grand Central Station is upstate. There's a lot of miles between Croton and Albany, Dan, just so you know. 
Fair enough. All right, man. Well, that was well, great. I got to take, take us out. I got to take us out. You just get uh, ready for your part, okay? Well, yes. that was the macro setup, Dan Nathan, on this <laughs> Tuesday, March 9th. And this macro setup was brought to you by a presenting sponsor, Nadex, the premier U.S. exchange for binary options, call spreads, and Dan? Knockouts, big guy. Got that right. See you next week. See you guys.